A show about finding great produce as close as your own backyard. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, I'm a guy that loves to grow all kinds of things, but I really love to grow some of my own vegetables. It's just something about growing some of the food that I eat. For instance, like this beautiful chard and these onions and kale. I also enjoy visiting places in and around my community where folks are producing locally grown, healthy, organic produce. It's really exciting to me. So in today's show, I'll show you a few things that I have growing in my garden that you can easily grow for yourself. Plus, we'll visit a local Christmas tree farm and Thomas Jefferson's vegetable garden. I'll also talk to an auctioneer about a few things I need to do before auctioning some of the animals here on the farm. So as you can see, we've got a lot to cover in today's show. So why don't we start up in the vegetable garden and I'm going to show you something that's really not considered edible, but I think you'll find it fascinating. You know, there are just some things that are fun to grow, like gourds. I've grown gourds ever since I was a little kid. There's just something outrageous about them. I've had gourd vines grow longer than 40 or even 50 feet in a single growing season. You see, if you plant the seed in the summer, once the soil temperatures warm up, you can't believe how quickly these things will grow. You see, I grow them strictly for their decorative purposes. They can be beautiful on centerpieces, they actually look great for fall decorations. I love to use them in the garden just to create a dramatic effect, like growing them over an arbor. Not only do you get this covering of big green leaves, you get these gourds hanging down, creating almost a surreal landscape. I have to say there's almost a sci-fi quality to gourds in that they grow so fast, inches a day, and they put out all these little tendrils. And these little tendrils will attach to anything really. That's why it's important that you have some sort of support system for them. In this case, I have a very long row of livestock wire and they're growing along here. And as the season progresses, I'll have lots of gourds to collect and use in decorating. If you're into cooking, or better than that, into good food, then you find yourself in the kitchen always reaching for garlic, at least I do. I like to grow garlic, and this time of year we're beginning to harvest what we planted back in the early spring. You see, if you harvest garlic too soon, the cloves or the bulbs don't mature fully, and if you wait too long, well, those cloves can split, and you can actually cause some of the stems to rot. It makes it difficult to pull it out of the ground. Now you see, the easiest way to know when to harvest a garlic is just to look at the leaves. When the leaves are about a third brown. You'll need to start testing the bulbs to see if they're the proper size. This is easy to do. Just simply loosen the dirt above one or two of the garlic bulbs to get an idea of their size while still keeping them in the ground. If they look large enough, then you're ready to make your garlic garden harvest. And if they still look too small, then just leave them alone and let them grow a bit longer. Now take a look at this one. This is perfect. You can see how much dieback we already have on the plant itself. And look at the size of that bulb. It's a really nice size that will probably yield about seven or eight cloves. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you get these pulled up despite the size of the bulb. Once the foliage dies, go ahead and get them pulled up even if you end up with small bulbs. This is one of my favorite varieties. It's called Italian Easy Peel. And it just um, is called that because, well, it's easy to grow, but more than that, it's easy to take the skin off the garlic when you're getting ready to crush it and use it in the kitchen. Now, one tip, I like for the soil to be slightly moist. It just makes pulling the garlic out of the ground much easier. You can take a little trowel like this to give it a boost, but if you let the soil get too dry and hard, 
you'll often snap them off right here. Now we bundle these in bundles of 10 plants and hang them in a cool, dry place, and they'll have garlic throughout the entire season. If you're like me and you love a fresh cut Christmas tree, there are a few things you'll want to keep in mind. First, think about getting your tree from a Christmas tree farm in your area. Randy Motley owns a Christmas tree farm and he shows us how to pick the best tree and how to properly care for it when you bring it into your home. Out here, all the trees are still growing in the field. They're all going to be fresh cut. So the only thing really you have to be looking for is a tree that looks the best to you. And on a Christmas tree farm, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so whatever tree looks right for you is going to be the right tree. Uh, Leyland Cypress probably has the longest shelf life if it's taken care of well, given plenty of water. Uh, all these trees, since they are fresh growing trees, uh, they're all going to last well past Christmas. The number one thing is water. Uh, a tree has to have all the water it will drink. Uh, you should probably check it twice a day. Uh, have a Christmas tree stand with a large reservoir that holds a lot of water. The main thing is not let the tree ever go dry once you move it in the house. Early last fall, I was in the throes of getting a few animals ready to go to a local auction. Robert King is a local auctioneer who stopped by the farm to pick them up and give me a heads up on the process. So Robert, with the auction tomorrow, what all was involved in kind of getting that together? Well, the day before, we just have, you know, a lot of cleaning and getting our pens cleaned up and everything, getting our sale ring fresh, you know, uh, uh, sawdust in the ring and everything, just mainly getting prepared for the next day. We do have uh, several consigners come in on Friday afternoons. And of course, when they get there, we, uh, we put back tags on all the animals so that way it identifies who they belong to. Right, you don't want them to get it mixed up. <laughs> right, and we give them a receipt. It'll have their name and address and uh, the back tag numbers of the animals that they brought in. And then we put them in a pen. Uh, if we keep them overnight, we have fresh water and hay for them. And then we arrive about 7.30 on Saturday mornings. People start coming in. Of course, this is the time when it gives everybody an opportunity to look at the stock and kind of make up their minds what they may want to bid on. Yes, we, we let everybody come in and, and walk down the alleys and, and view the, the pen, view the animals. And sometimes they'll ask some of our, our people that work there, you know, where do these come from? Do you know anything about them? And we tell them as much as we can. Sure. And uh, they. Uh, that's just a big gathering back there in the mornings. People just up and down the alleys, you know, looking and writing down numbers and, you know, getting ready for one o'clock. Well, it's really kind of an exciting thing. It's almost a community event, I've found. There are a lot of people there that show up yeah. Saturday after Saturday. And Oh, yeah, we have, we have people that come, doesn't miss a sale, you know. It's a, it's a Saturday outing for them, and they come and eat. We have a guy there that uh, has a barbecue. I've been when you've had a lot of goats and sheep, but is there a particular line of animals that you focus on? Well, our, our main focus is the goats and sheep. Uh, we do sell uh, baby calves, and we sell calves that are less than 300 pounds. Um, and then um, a, a few years ago, we started selling poultry, rabbits, all other uh, caged animals. So you're, you're likely to have on any given Saturday uh, rabbits, but also chickens, ducks, geese, and turkeys. Yeah, guineas, uh, just anything. And then we'll have a little bit of farm-related items that we sell that, that pertain to the goat and sheep and poultry business. And, and that's pretty much what we focus on. When the auction starts, you give the farmer or the, or the rancher an opportunity to sort of talk about their stock. Right. It's, um, when their animals come in, if they want to, uh, you know, hop up and say, hey, this is my nanny or this is my you, uh, you know, she's such and such of age, she's bred to, to this and that, you know, it just, 
it gives the uh, buyers an opportunity to know a little bit more about what they're what they're looking at. So uh, yeah, they they do you know kind of represent their animals you know if they want to. Of course, one of the advantages for me is that you're local. You're only about 35 miles away, so that helps. Yes, sir. Yeah. Pl plus, I came and got them. For <laughs> That's right, and that I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. The setup that you have gives local farmers an opportunity to sell what they raise and also buy some things as well. Yes, yeah, it does. You know, and a few years ago, before we before we opened, uh, a lot of your larger farmers were actually having to, you know, haul some out of state. But, you know, this is giving the, the local people a chance to, to, to get involved and, you know, buy and sell. And so it's worked out, you know, really good. Yeah. Well, Robert, it'll be interesting to see how well my sheep do tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they, they're going to do good. You'll be happy. Well, the market's good right now, and uh, you've got some good ones, so I think you'll be happy. Well, you know, on one hand, I hate to see them go. On the other hand, I'm happy to wave yeah. goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've... Y'all got to get rid of them sooner or later. That's right. Well, thanks for being out here today. Well, thank you. On a recent trip to Chicago, I stopped by my friend Shauna Coronado's house to see the garden she created for her community to enjoy. Shauna, this is one of the most beautiful things that I've seen you do. And you know why? Because you've, you're sharing the beauty with everybody that drives by that busy road. This is a community garden built for the community, all about the community. It's a drought tolerant native plant garden as well. And so very little maintenance has to happen back here. Now I do have to weed. But outside of that, there's no heavy watering. You don't have to worry about the plants individually. Sure. So the neighbors that come by, they just see beauty. And, yeah. and if there is a weed occasionally, we don't care. There's a lot of beauty here. Now, what did this look like before and what was your inspiration <laughs> to, to paint this picture along this canvas, this wooden fence? It was really grass. That's all there was to it. And for many years, the city didn't mow it either. So it was very ugly, horrid looking grass. And I thought, you know, why not do something different? It was an underutilized space. It was, and so when I came, I, and besides, I'd run out of space in my front lawn. <laughs> I had to come out back. Oh, I've seen your work, <laughs> <Yeah>. I know. <laughs> and when I came out back, the idea was, what can I do that really reflects on the community and builds the economic value here so that other people start gardening as well. And you'll see everyone around here is starting to do something in their yard it's now. It's very contagious. It is. Well, beauty Yay. is contagious, yeah. <laughs> well, I love the range of plants that you have here. I mean, as you said, they are many of them are drought tolerant, but you've got the, the beautiful um, purple cone flowers of all different types. You've got of course, the classic black-eyed Susan, which is really showing out today. It's a native here as well. And then there's a few annuals mixed in also. So, Shauna, speaking of annuals, I really like this little gomfrina. Oh, beautiful annual, drought tolerant, uh -huh. which is the key back here, you know. Well, the whole family is very easy to grow, too. It looks like it has lights on the tips. They're little yellow lights, and all of the family has this, but these magenta purple color, just beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love this hyssop you have blooming behind there. It's perfect with the Black Eyed Susan. It is, but better yet, it smells like licorice. It does. And it's wonderful, and yeah. it really gets heavy bees, and we want bees in this garden. You do. You want to encourage those pollinators. And what's wonderful about the hyssop, um, we grow one called Color Spires Blue, which mm. is very good, um, is that it blooms all the time. All summer, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, and you know, um, I noticed that you have some classics here. You have daylilies, you also have uh, some nice varieties of sedum. Well, the sedum especially, I have matrona, which is my favorite. It's yeah. just a beautiful color. But it is so drought tolerant. I mean, you don't have to water it all summer, pay attention to it, no, no, do nothing. It just looks pretty. How well, can you beat that in a garden? Well, you can't. I mean, <laughs> the plant actually stores up so much moisture in those thick leathery leaves. Absolutely. And I have one sunflower, just one. But it's... <laughs> well, it is majestic. <laughs> it's making quite a statement right there. 
It is indeed a Colossus Monstrosus. <laughs> I'm surprised it hasn't stopped traffic along this exactly. busy road. It does sometimes. When I'm out here weeding, lots of times people will stop to wave and say hello. And in fact, people come along here when they're walking their dogs and their kids and, and hug me. And it makes me feel so special to be a part of this community. And so I think that communities all across the United States, building a garden like this, it increases your economic value. It increases community connection. It's so good. Well, you know, I'm inspired and I mm -hmm. really appreciate you sharing this garden with us and the community. Well, thank you. I find Thomas Jefferson's home Monticello so inspiring. When I was there last, I had an opportunity to visit with my friend Peter Hatch. He's the director of gardens and grounds at Monticello, and he gave me a tour of the enormous vegetable garden. Peter, I have to say the vegetable garden looks fantastic, particularly after such a hot, dry summer. Well, we've had some nice, nice good rain lately, Alan, and the, the garden has revived a little bit after a long summer. Well, give me a sense of the scale of this uh, terrace. It's a big terrace, isn't it? Right. This was really Jefferson's retirement garden after he left the presidency uh, from 1809 to 1824. And um, it was uh, sort of a barometer of his health to come into this garden and sow peas and um, write down when his salsa if he came to the table. But it's an American garden, I think, in its scale and scope. This thousand foot long uh, plateau or terrace was literally hewed out of the side of the mountain on the southeastern slope. So a thousand feet long. Three football fields. Um, it's, a, it's a massive garden. It was supported by a, a stone wall that's 12 feet high. My word. And below the wall was a 200 tree or 400 tree orchard with two vineyards that were surrounded by the fruit trees. The, the garden itself was a real passion for him, wasn't it? Right. I think it was, uh, Jefferson wrote that the greatest service which can be rendered in any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. And, uh, this garden became an experimental laboratory for him where he experimented with 330 varieties of vegetables. And 330? He was kind of a seedy missionary as he would exchange um, <laughs> the latest in uh, garden fashion with uh, friends and neighbors and some of the leading plantsmen around the world. So it was, a, it was an ongoing passion for Jefferson. He had this unbelievable exuberance about gardening. Even as late as 83 years old when he read about um, giant cucumbers in a Cleveland, Ohio newspaper. And he wrote the governor of Ohio and asked him for seeds and <laughs> passed them out to his friends and measured each one. And uh, he described himself as an old man but a young gardener. And, uh, that cucumber story is, expresses that very well. When he was president, he kept a, a chart over the eight years of his presidency of when 37 different vegetables first appeared and then disappeared from the farmer's market in Washington. And according to one of his friends, uh, foreign embassies would vie with each other to give Jefferson the most unusual type of vegetable. Jefferson in turn would take the seeds and pass them out to local farmers and uh, then he ordered his French maitre d' who did the shopping to pay the highest prices for the best looking uh, <laughs> okra or the finest tomatoes. Well there's an incentive. It's a great window into early American cuisine but also reflects uh, you know, the legacy in local food and um, sponsorship of uh, sustainable agriculture that Jefferson was so involved with during his presidency. Now you're totally organic here which is, which is marvelous. Uh, help, help me understand and help, help our viewer understand uh, you know, a takeaway from Jefferson about growing vegetables organically and, and making right. the most of your time, resources, and space. When Jefferson was uh, serving as Secretary of State in the 1790s, he got a letter from his daughter Martha, and she complained about how the uh, bugs were ravaging her cabbage plants as fast as she could set them out in the garden. And Jefferson responded to her by saying, well, that next winter they would cover the entire garden with a heavy coating of manure. He said, when plants are growing in rich soil, they will, in Jefferson's words, bid defiance to all sorts of pests and diseases and droughts and all the things that afflict us in a southern summer here at, uh, at Monticello. So it was a great rallying cry for the organic gardening movement. He didn't have too many alternatives at the time, <laughs> but the belief that healthy soil produces healthy plants is at the, uh, at the core, I think, of all the gardening experience. Absolutely. Peter, it's been a pleasure being in the vegetable garden with you today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming. Here in my studio, I really enjoy taking a look at photographs that you, the viewer, send to me. We play around with ideas that might improve the landscape. Now today, we're taking a look at some pictures from Tara in Wisconsin. And Tara tells me that these plants around the foundation of her house were there when she moved in. 
Now, what's interesting here across this planting, you see that we actually have five different types of plants across here. And it's a very small space. And one of the rules of formality and one of the rules of sort of Asian design and both of those uh, styles Terra likes uh, would be simplicity. We need to really simplify the palette here. These plants have really overgrown the space, particularly this, which looks like an arbovita, and this looks like a Chinese juniper, really too big for this area. So what I'm gonna suggest is that we do away with this. We do away with this. In fact, I just think we ought to do away with all these shrubs and start with a clean palette. If we do that, um, I would propose that we even go a step further and think about this yellow color and maybe go with a, a very soft taupe color that comes off of this brown. So it'd be almost a dove grayish brown color if you would paint this gable end of the house, the garage door, and this side of the house over here. That would really cool everything down. You're sort of picking up the browns uh, in the brick here and playing that up. The foundation, I would also paint not the yellow, but I would go with this dark brown that you've trimmed the house in, Tara. Just a suggestion. Now, if we take away these large shrubs, we start from the ground up. Uh, being in Wisconsin, you need plants that are really tough and durable. I like the fact that you're interested in Japanese maples. So why don't we go with some plants that would be really easy to care for? I'm gonna suggest that you just use a U here and a U here on this corner. And let's go ahead and bring a U up here and we'll put a U here, okay? And then there are some low growing U's where you could do one, to here, and I notice over here you're doing really well with hosta. I'm not sure which direction this house faces, but then what I would do is fill in here, Tara, with some really beautiful leafed hostas. All around these evergreen shrubs, I would fill in with hosta, like this. Bring them over here as well, and I would bring a bed that would sweep out into the yard. Let me get a different color here, all right? I'm gonna bring a bed that sweeps out into the yard here. And then in this place, this is where I would like to see you maybe do a Japanese maple here. One of those weeping low Japanese maples. You'd have your U coming up behind it. You could even add two or three. I'm not sure how much space you have out here into the lawn, but I'd also do another Japanese maple over here where the driveway intersects with this walkway. Those are gonna give you some great color during the growing season. Now back here, um, I would build a fence that would come across here with sort of a scallop. It would be a solid board fence. It wouldn't have to be very tall, maybe four feet tall, just a board plank fence. It could have a post with some sort of finial over it here or just some sort of cap. And I would paint that dark brown so you don't see the air conditioning unit beyond. And right behind it, I would plant a PG hydrangea, like limelight hydrangea, which would bloom here. I really think that's all you would need, Tara, to, to bring a lot of harmony to this space. Good luck with your project. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and I hope you've been inspired to maybe grow a little bit of what you eat, or at least support those in your own community who are producing really high quality organic produce. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.